Honestly, it has been just an incredibly weird year for me. Um, I was trying to figure out whether I was going to do a top 10 list of games or a top five list of games. And every single time that I thought about it, I kept going through and through and through, and I eventually landed on doing a top five. However, I do have some honorable mentions. Now, the first of these honorable mentions are actually games that are kind of reprints or reimaginings of older games that I excluded from this list on purpose just because I know that they're really not bringing that much new to the table. They are really just reimaginings of older games. I did want to mention them here, though, because these are the ones that stuck out to me the most. These are the, the ones that I liked the most. And trust me, these are all great games. The reason why I'm mentioning them is because if I was to include them, they definitely would probably be in a top 10. So I'm just going to mention those games here. That is going to be Dune Uprising. Um, this version of the game just adds more. It is like the gamers version or even more gamers version of Dune Imperium. I think it's excellent. We've got spies. They've got, you know, all the new characters. And I think it's absolutely wonderful. It's a really, really, really good reimagining of the original game. We've got Everdell Far Shore. For some reason, this just feels fresh and new, but it also really doesn't have much new to it. There is a lot of quality of life improvements. You can get through the deck a little bit faster and the more that I play this version of the game the more that I like it even maybe over the original Everdell which is wild to say and lastly we've got Age of Innovation this is a re kind of like a new version of Terra Mystica it's very much Terra Mystica though the thing that I love most about this version is that there is a race and a land combination and you actually get to kind of combine those in order to create a unique race to work your way through the game and score points and that really creates so many fun combinations throughout the game all three of these were amazing kind of new additions of older games I think they are all wonderful and I definitely think you should check them out and moving on to my honorable mentions, things that didn't really make it to that top five, but games that I wanted to mention because they did make an impact on me. We're going to start with White Castle. Now, the thing about White Castle is I was able to play it towards the end of 2023. This is Devere's new title that is supposed to be somewhat like Red Cathedral, a game that I truly love. I was able to play White Castle, and yes, it is hecka good. The thing, though, is that I just didn't have enough time with it, and I think that if I had more time with it, it could definitely go up on kind of this list. So I didn't really include it in my top five, but I wanted to give it this honorable mention because I think it is a wonderful little game and it has such such good little comboing moments. I think the more I play it, the more that I will find. Um, the next one would be Wild Tiled West. This is uh, Dire Wolf's new game, which is one of the first uh, kind of tile laying games that I've actually enjoyed, Polyomino. And it is kind of a weird game where you're rolling dice in order to determine what uh, what tiles you can actually access in the board. Um, I found that system to be very, very intriguing, and I found it to be a very like gamer heavy polyomino game. Um, I'm not usually a, like a fan of these types of games, but Wild Tiled West with the art style, with the, the anthropomorphic cowboy animals, all of the different strategic paths you could go down in it, um, that it really made an impression and I, I really, really dug it. And last on my honorable mention list is Blazon. This production is out of this world. As you'll see later, I am a huge fan of medieval ages and heraldry and all of that. It is a huge, huge buy-in for me. So when I backed this game, um, I was actually really, really pleased with one, the production, but also its clever way of gaining tiles. Um, that is just one of the most cool things about the game is how you're actually gaining cards. It's a very unique system. I really like this Euro game. I think it is a wonderful, wonderful Wonderful production. It's a very, very fun game, but it did not make my top five of the year. With all that being said, let's go ahead and jump right in to my top five of the year, starting with That Is Not A Hat.
Now That's Not A Hat is a game that truly surprised me and I actually don't even have the game right now to show it off. And the reason for that is because I actually let my brother borrow it. And that's a funny thing about this game is that Everyone that I've played it with so far has either asked, how can I buy this game? Or can I borrow it for a family event? So I didn't even have it on New Year's. My brother borrowed it and played it with uh, his wife's family and him. So they had a great time with it. But That's Not A Hat, if you don't know, is a very, very, very simple memory game where you have a deck of cards Everybody gets a card, we all look at each other's cards, and then we can just keep looking for a little bit, and then we just flip that card over, and that is that. Then a player will grab a card from the top of the deck and reveal what it is to everyone at the table, put it face down, and pass it the direction that the back of the card tells you to, and states what that card is to that player. Then that player can either accept that gift or deny it, saying that it's not that item. But if they accept it, uh, they have to take the card that they already had and pass it saying what that item is. And it continues and continues around the table. So funny story about this game, I was teaching it to my family and I remember specifically that I had grabbed the bell card and I was like, I don't want the bell card in the game. So I put it like in the middle of the deck. And as we were kind of playing over and over these rounds, um, it, in that particular round, eventually somebody thought that the bell card was actually in the game. And every single one of us at the table believed that the bell card was in the game. Only at the very end of the game, when we were all questioning where in the world is the bell card, we all flipped our cards over, there's no bell card, and we all remembered simultaneously that well before I even set up the game, I had placed that bell card in the middle of the deck. And that's the funny stuff that you can get in this game where everybody can really convince each other of something. They can convince each other that this face down card is this item and you start losing the truth, but you're still kind of just working with it and you're trying to just collect the least amount of cards. That's Not A Hat is such a clever little game that has made some really, really big moments and it's one that I want to bring to more people because every single time I've introduced it to people, People have laughed, they've enjoyed it around the table, and they've wanted to know how they can get it. And that is just really what this hobby is about. So That's Not A Hat is my fifth best game of 2023. Moving on to the next one is going to be Zoo Vadis. This is negotiation up the wazoo. Um, that was clever. That was very, very clever. But this is essentially a game that is completely about negotiation. There is a zoo, everybody gets an asymmetric animal that they get to play, and you are trying to move up your animals through the zoo. By the way, I actually have a detailed video of this game, so definitely check that out if you are interested in kind of diving into this specific title and really learning a little bit more about it. But this is a reprint of Quo Vadis, but this is an older Reiner Knizia title. It is uh, essentially a really simple game to play. and. Once again, this is a game that was really easy for me to introduce to people. Um, I've, I've been playing this with non-gamers, I've been playing this with gamers, and I've liked it at every single one of those groups and player counts that I've played it at. But essentially, you are just trying to get your zoo animals up to the top of this board. And it's really as simple as that. You're, you're, you're placing your animals at the bottom of it and you're trying to move forward. The thing is, you can't actually move forward unless you have the majority inside of that room that you're leaving. And so there's different rooms of varying sizes. Let's say there was a room uh, of four spots. I need at least three spots in order to move out. Oftentimes, you're not going to have three of your own animal in order to move out. So that is where the game gets good. You have to make negotiations. You have to be like, hey, yo, can you let me through? And you're asking other players that have animals there to negotiate with you, to let you through, to let you pass and move forward. They're gonna get a little bit of money for that, which is victory points in the game. And then you're gonna move forward also getting points because as you pass these paths on the board, you're gonna be collecting laurel tokens, which are victory points. And the game really does kind of come to a place where everybody has helped each other, but also has hindered each other. And the deals get more and more engaging as you go. And the meta game gets more and more insane as you play with the same group over and over. Another reason why I love this game is the art style is absolutely gorgeous and the asymmetric factions in the game 
instead of being asymmetric towards you, it's so strange. Your asymmetric ability is just a tradable asset. So you might have the ability to allow somebody to walk along special paths that only your faction can give other players access to. I can't use those special paths, but I can give other players that ability and I can use that in my deal making. This game's all about deal making and all about negotiation. And you guys know that that is something that I absolutely love. So if you want a game that's going to have a lot of yelling, a lot of laughs and a lot of negotiation and really, really, really easy to learn and to teach and to play, Zuvatis is going to be the game for you. And that is my number four game for 2023. All right, so you guys know that I am a absolute huge fan of history in general and medieval history, which I talked about a little bit earlier with uh, Blizzon. So I have been enjoying this series of games for quite some time. It is the Levy and Campaign series. I have played Nevsky, I have played Almoravid, I have played Inferno, and the fourth in that game series is Plantagenet. And this version of the game is specifically about the War of Roses which if you don't know is kind of York going up against Lancaster in a series of kind of escalating fights and battles. These were two families that tore each other to pieces for most of the 15th century. And as they competed for the throne of England, there was a lot of bloodshed and absolute terrible stuff going on. And you are taking on one of these two sides, York or Lancaster, and you are trying to gain enough victory points to win the game in what is a operational war game that kind of feels a little bit Euro-y, but with some insanely crazy battles that don't feel Euro-y at all. So it's really a combination of multiple things. The reason why I love this series of games so much I'm going to talk about the series really quickly first before I dive into the reasons why Plantagenet is my top three game of 2023 for the release. But the reason why I love all of the games so much is that they really make you feel like you are in medieval warfare, that you are kind of taking care and leading this army to victory or to disaster because you're taking care of feeding these troops, making sure that they can travel. And some of the games have more harsh winters or more harsh environments that you have to plan for. You have to get sleds or move to wagons. Like there is all of these different things. You have to pay your lords in order to stick around the battlefield because if you're not paying them, they are going to leave you. Like it's those kind of decisions that you are dealing with in this game. And because of that, it is a very big, complex game. And Plantagenet, the reason why I think it has jumped forward in a different direction with the genre, a direction that I absolutely love, a direction that has made it be so high on my list this year, is that it has kind of shortened the rulebook in so many areas. It's really cleaned up a lot of edge cases. It got rid of sieges, which I think that will make some people sad. But for me, it really helps for me to get it in front of more people and not just play alone, but to be able to play with other people is so much fun. It is easier to play. You can get into the action a little quicker and it's just cleaner overall for me. It's the easiest version that I've found to teach. So I really highly recommend if you are interested in a deep and thoughtful war game um, with some really, really interesting mechanisms like a, a calendar, a, a system where you are literally levying lords to come and fight for you. And those lords have a time limit and they will leave you at some point and you have to plan around keeping them on the battlefield while you're still actually fighting on the battlefield and doing kind of full scale war, guys, Plantagenet and the Levian Campaign series could potentially be the game for you. I really highly recommend this one. I think it is absolute gorgeous production, amazing graphic design, awesome rule book, and so far my favorite of the series. So definitely check it out if you are interested. And that is why Plantagenet is my number three for the year.
Now the next game that we are going to talk about is going to be Sale. And this game came as such a surprise for me because it is such a small box, it is such a small package, but yo, dude, this game is literally so gorgeous and it is so easy to teach but it is one of the most fun two-player games that I have played in a long time. It's it's a game that makes me irritated, which I think one of the things that I love most about games is them bringing out really big feelings in me. Um, and Sale makes me mad because I feel like I suck at it and I keep trying to play it and I keep trying to be good and I'm not and I still enjoy it and I keep coming back to it and that's the reason why it's here. But if you don't know, Sale is essentially a trick-taking co-op game, and I think it's a perfect game for uh, people that want to kind of get to know each other a little better, because you can talk while playing, it's very, very light, so you can kind of just play cards and chat. But essentially, you're going to be playing a series of tricks. You have a little ship on one side of the board, and you're trying to get that ship over to the anchor section, and that's how you win. The weird thing is, is that you're going to be playing tricks, which if you don't know what a trick is, you know, you're playing a card and whoever has the highest card in the first card played suit will win the trick. And there's some things about that, but you know, basics of trick taking. Um, whoever wins the trick though, whoever has the higher card in the leading suit will basically move the ship towards that player. So it's either gonna go basically forward up or forward down, but really it's just gonna go towards the players that are sitting across the table. And that matters so much because there's going to be obstacles that are going to be in front of your boat. And you're trying to be like, okay, I don't want to win this trick because if I don't win this trick, then we will be able to avoid this obstacle. We won't hit the Kraken and then we don't have to sink, right? So then you're thinking, you're trying to get into each other's brains and you're like, okay, I need to lose this trick. You need to win this trick. And then you play your cards and you're like, how did we, how did we get here? How did, how did I win the trick with a two? You know, it's like these types of things are just so much fun to go through. And there is a lot of room for kind of working together and planning at the beginning of kind of each full round. You guys are each going to swap a card from your hand and give it to uh, the other player. And that kind of matters because it's a way to give a little bit of information on something that you might want to happen. For example, uh, as specific story, I had given uh, Kate a specific mermaid that I knew that I would be able to play my mermaid, and if she played that mermaid, we would be able to do the double jump where instead of moving towards her or towards me, you jump and basically get two spaces and move forward. And uh, I, I gave her that mermaid in order for her to know that I wanted her to play it, but it couldn't be too early, but in a little bit, I could get rid of all my cards so that I only had the one mermaid of that color so that I had to play it when she played her mermaid. And it worked. It played out beautifully. We were able to do it. We still lost overall, but it was so much fun to kind of work together and figure this moment out. And Literally, that's kind of the game. I mean, they've got uh, asymmetric characters that you can choose from, so you can get a new asymmetric ability each time, and those abilities really change up kind of some of the little abilities, or sorry, some of the little things that you can do throughout the game to make you feel clever and to make you feel interesting. And I really, really enjoy those uh, inside of the game. So yeah, that is Sale. I mean, if I'm looking for a game to play with Kate at two players, like I wanna pull Sale off the shelf and just keep playing, and that's why it's here. I want to keep playing the game. I don't want to stop. So Sale, that is my number two pick for 2023. And just really quickly, I've got some other tops of the year. I've got my best movie of the year, which was Napoleon. Yes, it was not very historically accurate. Yes, it had a ton of problems, but I still can't help 
from enjoying that movie. I loved it when I came out. I really can't wait for the even longer version cut of it. I think it was just really enjoyable to watch some of these war scenes play out, and I love Joaquin Phoenix's performance as Napoleon. Favorite show was definitely The Bear. I think The Bear season two was absolutely exquisite. Best movie soundtrack has got to be The Boy and the Heron. Joe Hisaishi's work in this is absolutely mad. Best book wasn't a 2023 book, but it was my reread of The Lord of the Rings. And lastly, my favorite channel of the year that I watched the most in the board game industry was Homo Ludens. Uh, they do history wargaming, and I definitely advise you to check them out. They are absolutely wonderful. All right, but that is it for my other tops of the year. Let us get to my number one pick. Voidfall is amazing. I don't know how else to explain this game. What I, I kind of knew what I was getting into because I saw the artwork by Ian O'Toole, amazing artist, by the way, actually same artist of Blazon. Um, they do amazing work. And I saw this world and this vision when I was looking at this game on Kickstarter. And I remember I was looking down the whole list. And at that time, I really wasn't doing very many Kickstarters and I'm still not really doing very many Kickstarters, but as I was looking at this, I could see the vision that they clearly had a, a set vision of this sci-fi universe, and they wanted you to jump into the game and feel like you are involved in that universe. I can tell you right now that this game is extremely engaging. It is essentially a Euro game, but it is also kind of a 4X space game. During the game, you're going to have a hand of many, many cards, and each of those cards is going to have an action or really just a a kind of thing that they want a directive, uh, a direction, I guess, um, that basically says like this round, I want to do a lot of building or this round, I want to do fighting. But each of these cards has three different actions within those that you are actually going to be using and activating and doing. And that is kind of the bulk of the game. You play a card, you do those actions on your turn. But the reason why the game is so interesting and so massive is just the sheer opportunity. Because when you're looking at those nine cards that you have at the start of the game, you're looking at all of those, and you realize that each of those has minimum two actions to potentially do, plus one action if you use a trade token, you can, you can get all three actions on that card in one turn. You've got a crud ton of options every single turn and I've never had a round where I wasn't thinking brain burning like I've got to figure out what I got to do on top of that on top of the puzzle of figuring out you know your action economy and what you got to do which by the way it's really weirdly simple because you're just playing a card and it you know the symbols which there's a lot of iconography in this game that might drive people insane i found it to be a second language as i've played one full game i was already kind of getting it but you just start knowing what cards are before you even you don't even have to reference the rule book i just kind of jumped in and kind of understood by the symbols but these really, really complex actions are super easy to understand with this iconography. But that's just one aspect of why this game is so freaking cool. The reason why it's even more amazing is the asymmetric factions. Like, dude, these are insane. They are very, very detailed. Um, every single faction has their own special ability, their own technology tree. Um, 
they have very, very different vibes. Like one might want to do more fighting and one might literally never fight. And there is so much different options with that aspect of the game. You're playing on a different board every game. You can play the game solo. You can play the game co-op. You can play the game competitive, all three of those. And the game basically works the same with just a little bit of added rules. And then at the end of the game, after you've kind of played out your empire, as you've kind of, you know, figured out which different hexes you want to take over and build all of these different production facilities and collect all of these different resources and figured out exactly how you want to score victory points, which I haven't even talked about that. My favorite part of the game is probably the fact that you you kind of build your victory point engine as you go. As you add these cards, you're determining what you score each round and they're very, very different. And so you want to collect these agenda cards, but you can't have multiple of the same type. So you might get one war agenda card, one technology agenda card, one commerce agenda card, all of these types of different things. And it's building out how your faction will score. And figuring out that puzzle, figuring out that is some of the most fun I've had in a game in a very long time. Especially, it was my best experience that I had this year for sure, which is why it is here on top of the list. Voidfall is amazing. It actually made me paint miniatures for a game, which I don't do, by the way. I barely ever paint miniatures for games. I don't even consider myself a good painter, but I am so proud of the paint jobs that I did for these miniatures. And I painted every single one of the spaceships uh, because I like this game a lot. If there was one thing that is holding it back, it's the setup time, which is massive, but trust me, Trust me when I tell you, it is worth it to set up this beast of a game to get an experience unlike any other where you were leading an empire, um, calculating all of the different things that you could in order to figure out what is the right decision at every moment and how do I lead my civilization to victory? What technology paths do I go down? What technology do I acquire? Do I take over the Voidborn next to me or do I try to slow down my opponent? Guys, there's a lot, man. There is a lot. I would highly recommend checking out Voidfall, but that is my game of the year for 2023. And I hope that this list of games gave you some inspiration to go check out more games. And what did I miss? What games did I not have on this list that you think that I should have checked out? Please leave a comment down below of those games and definitely let me know what your game of the year was or even go ahead and share your top five or top 10 of the year. I would love to chalk and chat with you guys down there. But thank you so much for watching this video. With that, let us go ahead and drop the beat.